Did you know that you can use Postgres as a cache? I know it sounds a bit hard to believe, but hear me out. You can build a simple caching service using just Postgres and some SQL, and I'm going to show you how in this video. Let's first consider what we need from a caching service. And of course, we have to start with key value storage, and you can implement this easily in Postgres by creating a table where the key is the primary key, and we can store the value of the cache entry as a JSON or JSONB element. The added benefit of using JSONB is that we can now use the SQL syntax that Postgres supports for querying JSON documents to implement some interesting data analysis on our cache data. The second thing we care about with a cache service is performance, and you'll see how Postgres delivers on this later when I show you some benchmarks. Then we need to be able to support cache invalidation by either writing to the same key, which which we can do, or removing a specific entry, which we can do using a simple delete statement. We will also want eviction, this is removing less frequently used cache entries when the cache is full. And lastly, we need support for cache expiration. Now we could implement the last two points using some sort of scheduled job. For example, we can use the pgcron extension to schedule a background job that can run inside of our database and it could execute some SQL function to evict less frequently used cache entries or completely remove expired entries. This is a bit out of scope for this video, but I'm just giving you an idea of what you can do with just simple Postgres. Now what is it that Postgres has that allows us to implement a caching service and make it efficient? Let me introduce you to unlock tables, which are just plain old tables, except they aren't locked. What I mean by this is that we don't generate the write ahead log entries for a table that is marked as unlocked. And this comes with some interesting characteristics. First, by not having to generate the write ahead log, we save on performance when writing data. The size of the table is smaller, and of course we have some drawbacks. Unlocked tables are only available on a primary database if we are using logical replication. Also, unlocked tables are going to stream write ahead log entries to any replicas. And in case of a crash or a forced shutdown, we could end up losing data inside of our unlocked table. But because we will be using it as a cache, we aren't really concerned by this. Cache data should be transient, and we should be comfortable losing it and having to recreate it from scratch. Now let's jump into the code, and I'll show you how we can implement this. I'm going to use .NET Aspire to quickly spin up my application that I'm going to use to implement caching with Postgres, and I'm just going to add a Postgres resource that's going to run inside of a Docker container. I'm also introducing a Redis resource, which is going to be useful when performing benchmarks to compare our caching implementation with Postgres versus performance with Redis. Then I have just one web API where I'm going to expose the functionality for caching, and I'm going to reference both my database and my cache. In the API itself, I'm adding a Redis client, which is going to configure an iConnection multiplexer instance, which is using Stack Exchange Redis behind the scenes, and I'm going to use this to implement the Redis side of things. And for Postgres, I'm going to add an MPG SQL data source, and I also install Dapper to slightly simplify my SQL queries. This is going to be my request object, the cache item containing a key, and a JSON element that I'm going to store as the value. So the first thing I'll need is a function to apply my database migrations, and let's make it static async task. I'm going to call it apply database migrations, and I'm just going to pass it a web application instance, and I'll just use this to resolve my application services. So let's call this right after we build my application. I'll say await apply database migrations and pass in the required argument. Now inside of it, what I need is to obtain a data source. I'm going to say app services get required service, and I need the MPG SQL data source, which I configured above using an Aspire package. Now I can use my data source to open a connection. I'll say data source open connection, and then I can use my connection to execute a database query. So I'll say connection, execute async, and I just need to provide the SQL statement that's going to apply my database migration. I already prepared this ahead of time in the create cache SQL file, so I'm going to copy this and drop it here, and now let's spend a brief moment commenting on what the table that I'm creating looks like. So I'm just going to call it cache, and the syntax is create unlogged table. I'm going to give it an integer primary key, which is going to be an auto incrementing value. Then I have my key, which is also marked as unique, and my value, which is a JSONB column. 
I also have a created at timestamp, which I'm going to default to the current UTC time, and this can be useful if I want to implement exploration. Now, I'm also adding an index on the key column to speed up queries because I'm going to be accessing this table based on the key column. If we wanted to be even more efficient, we could include the value column on the leaf node of this index. And because we typically only want to retrieve the value when querying this table, this can slightly improve the performance of this query. So now we can expose our caching functionality and I'm going to do it through an API endpoint. So I'll say right here, app map post and my route pattern is going to be postgres slash cache i need to specify the cache item as my first element and then i'm going to inject an additional service which is going to be my mpg sql data source and i want to do pretty much the same thing so i'm going to say using var connection and I'll use my data source to open the connection. And this allows me to execute a query using the connection. So I'll say query, execute async. Of course, I need to await this and let's specify my SQL. So what do I want to execute in this query? I'm going to drop the query in directly and let's comment on what I'm doing here. I'm doing a simple insert into the cache table. So this is very fundamental SQL. I want to provide the key and the value columns. The other two columns are going to be auto-generated and I'm providing the values through my parameters, which I'm going to send using Dapper. The parameter names will be key and value. If I run into a conflict, meaning the key value already exists, then I'm going to update it by overriding the existing value. So then let me provide the object. So I need to pass in a key and it's going to come from the cache item key. In this case, I can omit the property value. And then for the value property, I need to say cache item value and let's convert this into a JSON string. And finally, I can say return results dot okay and this completes my cache set method how do we implement fetching a value from the cache well it's just as easy i'll expose another endpoint let's call it postgres cache and then i'll specify key and route is going to be a map get endpoint and i just need the key which will come from the route and my data source and my query is going to be somewhat simpler i'm just selecting the value from the cache where the key matches the one I'm specifying in my request parameters. So this is going to give me back the value as a string. I have to say query async, give me back a string value. And then if the value is not null, I'm going to say results okay, JSON serializer. And let's serialize the object that we get back. We could also return the raw JSON. I just want to make sure that I can actually serialize this value without throwing an exception. Otherwise, I'm going to say return results not found. Now, if we care about the semantics of our query method, the most correct value to use here would be single or default async. And with these two endpoints in place, I can go ahead and test out my caching behavior. So let me start the application. This is going to spin up the Aspire dashboard. And if I go into the logs of my Postgres caching API, I can see that my SQL queries are executed successfully. So now I can go into an API testing tool like Postman and I can send a simple post request that contains my key and a value. So let me click send and I land on the breakpoint inside of my post endpoint where I'm just going to execute a simple insert into my database. You can see this completes and I get a response back in Postman. I can also send a get request to fetch the cache entry with this key. So I hit my breakpoint in the get endpoint and I can just execute my query to obtain the cache entry and I'm going to return it as a JSON document. Now, if you don't want to use the serializer, an alternative can be using JSON document and then you can say parse and pass in the value. And I just have to return the root element. So let's go ahead and just quickly test this out. I'll send the same query again to get our cache key. And you can see we get back the cached value. And the response time is relatively fast. It's between four and five milliseconds. And note that I'm going through the full flow of sending an API request and then querying the database and then returning the response back to the client. One more important thing I want to show you is how this compares to something like Redis, which is a very popular distributed cache. And I'm going to drop in two API endpoints, one for caching a value using Redis and another one for retrieving a value based on the key. Now the Redis implementation uses iConnection multiplexer to get a Redis database and is going to call either setStringAsync to add the value to the cache 
or get string async and then parsing it as a JSON document. In both cases, I'm assuming that I'm serializing a JSON value. Now, how am I going to run my benchmarks? I'm going to use a load testing tool called K6. And here is my K6 script for testing my insert performance. I'm going to run it using 50 virtual users for 20,000 iterations, which should equal to 1 million API calls. And what I want to do here is just store a random value represented by a key value pair by calling the respective post endpoint for either Postgres or the Redis cache. Now let's go ahead and run this. I'll open up a console window and say k6 run and then specify the name of my script file which is insert test.js and this is going to start my test and it may take a couple of moments to complete because I'm doing quite a bit of things on my machine like recording this video, running Visual Studio behind the scenes, running all of my containers required to execute this test. So I'm going to fast forward to the results and after about two minutes we get the results and they're quite interesting. The Postgres insert API endpoint completes in about 85 milliseconds while the Redis insert completes in 66 milliseconds. Now obviously the insert using Redis is faster which is what we expected but Postgres isn't really too far behind when it comes to storing data inside of the cache. Now let's also run the query script which I have here, I'm going to randomly load 100 keys into the database and then use them to call my two get endpoints inside of my load test. So let's go ahead and run this one. I'm going to clear the console and I'll say k6 run query test.js. And again, this is going to take a couple of minutes to complete. So I'll fast forward to the results. And the query test results are in. The average response time for fetching a value from our Postgres cache is 90 milliseconds while the Redis cache is fairly consistent at around 66 milliseconds. Now, obviously, Redis is the winner. So why should you consider using Postgres? Well, first of all, if you are already using Postgres as your application database, it's not a lot of overhead to just turn it into a cache. You don't need to provision an extra infrastructure component that you also need to manage and update when needed. And the second thing is SQL and your familiarity with it. With Redis, you will at least need an additional library to connect to your cache Whereas with Postgres, you can just write a SQL query. Now, I also want to show you one more bonus before we wrap up this video, and that's a simple implementation of a cache service abstraction using Postgres. I'm exposing a get async method that works with a generic type, just accepting a key and returning back an object. Then we have a set async and a remove async method. And this is what a typical caching abstraction would look like that you would use from your application. The implementation uses the same approach as I showed you in the API endpoints, where we write a SQL query to execute the desired behavior, which can be either querying from the table and returning our cached value, inserting the cached value or overriding it on conflict and then just executing a delete statement if we want to remove a cache key. If you want to grab the source code for this video, it's going to be available completely for free from the pinned comment right below. If you want to learn more about the amazing powers of Postgres, I recommend watching this video next. Make sure to smash the like button on your way out, and until next time, stay awesome.